So in my first lecture, I talked about propositional logic. So the next, uh, the next topic on the list is, is first order logic. Um, so once again, I assume that most people know what first order logic is, but I'll just give a quick overview, partly just to fix the notation or else uh, um, just to give an idea. Um, so the, the syntax of first order logic is a bit more involved than propositional logic. There are a few different layers. So first you have a set of so-called terms which are basically built up from variables and constants using function application. So in terms of abstract syntax, you can imagine that a term is either a variable or it's a constant applied to a list of, uh, a finite set or finite list of other terms. Um, you can think of constants as just being nullary functions. So if you think this is the traditional thing you would write, x plus 2y, you can imagine that as being the binary function f applied to the arguments x and the binary function times applied to the nullary function 2 and so on. So you can represent pretty much any sort of regular mathematical expressions in this form. So starting with the set of terms, then you can create the so-called atomic formulas um, basically by just um, applying some relation symbols to two terms. So again, I'm going to use the familiar notation x is greater than y, for example, when um, you might say, strictly speaking, according to the abstract syntax, it's something more like that. So, and then you can use all the usual propositional operations. So from that point on, you have all the uh, resources of propositional logic, and you also have the two quantifiers. Um, so for all x, p x, and there exists an x such that p x. I, I suspect this is quite familiar to most people here. Um, and of course, um, the order of quantifier nesting in first order logic is very important. So different uh, permutations of quantifiers have very different meanings. So here's a kind of real world example. If, uh, if loves is the binary predicate for x loves y, then for all x there exists a y, it means that everyone loves someone. Um, then there exists an x such that for all y loves x, y means that there is some person who loves everybody, some very kind-hearted person. And then um, there exists a y such that for all x, x loves y means there is someone, um, some very desirable person, y, who everybody loves, and so on. So order of quantification is critical. And this is true not just in frivolous examples like this, but in mathematics too. For example, um, this formula basically is what it means for a real-to-real function, -real function to be continuous. Um, for every epsilon, if epsilon is greater than zero, then for every x, there exists a delta which is greater than zero such that this holds. But if you um, change the order of quantification slightly, so instead of saying for all x, there exists a delta, you say there exists a delta for all x, then that actually says that the function is uniformly continuous. So, oops, um, I, it's kind of interesting, for example, that in the early days of mathematics, there was a lot of confusion about the distinction between continuity and uniform continuity. In fact, it was only I guess uh, a lot later that people really defined uniform continuity properly. So sometimes I wonder if people had used a formal language instead of just trying to express these things in words, perhaps people would actually have understood some of these concepts a bit more clearly when they were being introduced. I don't know, but it's, it's possible. Because a lot of even quite great mathematicians were, were confused about uniform continuity in the early days. You know, even Cauchy and people like that um, wrote some very mixed up things. Um, so, uh, so I, uh, as I say, I'm talking mostly about classical first order logic and one very important um, technique in automated theorem proving in classical logic is scholarization. So the basic insight of scholarization is that the following formula is valid. 
for all x, there exists a y such that pxy, if and only if, there exists a function f such that for all x, p x of fx. Um, in, in, if you think of this as a general mathematical principle, then this is actually pretty much the axiom of choice when you think about it, because it's basically saying, um, if for each x you can choose a y that has a certain property, then you can define a function that actually picks out some suitable thing. Um, but anyway, um, this, um, the validity of this is the starting point of scholarization. Um, so here, here's an example. Um, what does it mean for a function to be surjective or onto? It means um, that for every x in the range, there exists a y such that gy equals x, right? So if you actually just mechanically apply that scholarization transformation, um, where px of y is replaced by the formula gy equals x, you get this which is actually exactly saying that there is a function that is the right inverse of g. So it's kind of a classic categorical way of describing a function as being surjective. Um, it's interesting, I think, to see that it's just an instance of, of scholarization. So I said that this is a basic uh, technique in first order logic, in classical first order logic, but how can that be given that uh, the right hand side of that isn't a first order formula? It's not a first order formula because we're quantifying over um, functions, not just over um, elements of our domain. Well, it's true that in first order logic, uh, we can't actually express that as a logical equivalence but we can do something a little bit like what we did with definitional CNF. We can introduce new symbols. So we can consider, instead of saying there exists an F, we can introduce a new function symbol F um, and let the existence be implicit. So in other words, given a formula for all x1 up to xn, there exists a y such that that, scholarization consists of basically introducing a new function symbol, a new first order function symbol F that's not already used in the formula, and replacing this formula with its scholarized equivalent where the variable y gets replaced with that. Just as in the case of definitional CNF, this is not a logically equivalent formula um, because we've introduced a new function which you could interpret the wrong way, so to speak. But once again, it preserves satisfiability. So if the only question we're asking is, is a first order formula satisfiable, then we can just as well ask that question of its scholarized form. So that's, that's actually a big help because most of the normal form transformations that I talked about in propositional logic also work just as well for quantifiers. For example, you can push negations through quantifiers by saying not exists replacing not exists with for all not and so on, just infinite versions of the De Morgan laws. And then there are also these uh, prenexing um, transformations where you can pull quantifiers out of expressions. And then if you combine that with scholarization, it turns out that you only need to, to decide satisfiability of for formulas that are universally quantified at the cost of introducing new function symbols. So this is a very powerful tool in that, um, as, you know, as the examples at the beginning indicated, uh, quantifiers can be nested in very complex ways inside formulas. But if you just apply this mechanical transformation of going to negation normal form, pulling the quantifiers out, and then using scholarization, um, scholarization allows you to ensure that there are no um, existential quantifiers left because you just replace them all with these scholum functions. Notice that if, um, if you just have no universal quantifiers and just an existential quantifier at the beginning, then effectively this thing is just a constant because it's a nullary function. So you can think of this as just introducing a so-called scholum constant. Uh, this is named after uh, Thoralf Skolem, by the way, a logician, but it, it was also used by other logicians, so some people say it should be called something else. <laughs>
So to decide satisfiability of a first order formula, thanks to these uh, pre-processing transformations, it suffices to be able to decide the satisfiability of a universally quantified formula, which is in principle a much simpler problem. But it's still a priori not obvious that that problem is decidable or semi-decidable or anything because a universally quantified formula to test it for satisfiability, in principle, you'd have to test every possible model of the function symbols, of which there are infinitely many. And in each of those models, you'd have to test all possible assignments of the variable, of which there might also be infinitely many. So certainly there's no kind of brute force technique. There's nothing like truth tables. So we have to be a little bit more subtle. Um, and indeed, uh, it turns out that um, satisfiability isn't decidable, but it is at least semi-decidable. Um, and the key to this is this, well, there are two theorems that are often called Herbrandt's theorem and the compactness theorem. Um, these are a little bit technical to prove, so I won't prove them here. You can find the proofs in my book. It's not really that hard, but it requires a bit of work. Um, but this is the kind of top line statement, which I've tried to make somewhat precise. So suppose you have the following first order formula um, where you have a bunch of universal quantifiers for all x1 up to xn and then some formula which does not itself involve any quantifiers. So this is assuming you've done all the pre-processing and scholarization first. And so our, our task is to decide the satisfiability of this formula. So this formula, th then this uh, theorem says basically that that formula is satisfiable if and only if all finite sets of ground instances that arise by replacing the variables by arbitrary variable free terms is propositionally satisfiable. So this is a bit of a mouthful. So intuitively what it means is um, your first order formula has some set of function symbols which you may have actually expanded because of scholarization. So consider all possible terms that you can build up just using the constant symbol. So um, for example, is this an eraser? Yeah, I guess. Is that? It's, although it's a bit slow. I guess. Is there a quicker algorithm? Anyway. Um, so for example, if your function symbols were, say, the constant 0 and 1 and the uh, binary addition operation, then the kind of... Um, Oh, right, thanks, there's one there. Okay, that's, that's great, thanks. Uh -huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, yeah, all of that, all of that can go, yeah, thank you. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good, thank you. Um, so, so if you have some, some particular first order language, so let's say our constants are zero and one and we have a binary connective plus, then what do I mean by ground instances? So ground terms, ground basically means not involving a variable. So the ground terms are all those that you can create by basically making terms up from functions and constants. So for example, zero, one, 0 plus 0, 0 plus 1, 1 plus 0, 1 plus 1, 0 plus 0 plus 0, etc. So even with a small set of um, constants and functions, there are usually infinitely many um, possible terms you can produce. So that's the set of ground terms. So what Herbrand's theorem is basically saying is that um, this formula is satisfiable provided that the set of, well, provided the set of all its possible ground instances are satisfiable. That's usually an infinite set of formulas, but then, because of the compactness theorem for proposition logic, it suffices to say if all finite sets of ground instances are satisfiable. So this theorem might look somewhat abstruse, but it's actually, it almost immediately contains a semi-decision procedure for propositional, for first order logic. Not necessarily the best one, but at least a semi-decision procedure. Because if you want to test this formula for um, satisfiability, um, then you just need to run through all 
finite sets of ground instances and test them for propositional satisfiability. Now, of course, that's not necessarily a great algorithm, but it, uh, this actually does show that validity, at least in principle, is semi-decidable. So there's an algorithm for satisfiability. Um, and if a formula is, uh, is unsatisfiable, it will eventually tell you because you know, you'll eventually find you know, maybe a list of three billion ground instances which is propositionally unsatisfiable and that tells you that the formula is unsatisfiable. But if the original formula was satisfiable, this might run forever. It's only a semi-decision procedure. So you can motivate the, um, the techniques that are used for first order logic in various ways. So some people think of them more proof theoretically, but I think most of them can be seen as, uh, sorry, as more or less direct or somewhat slightly indirect applications of this theorem. So this is really at the core of most classical first order theorem proving techniques. Um, so here, here's an example um, to perhaps make this a little bit clearer. Um, there is this formula that is sometimes called the drinker's principle because um, it asserts that there is some person X such that um, for every other person Y, if X drinks, then everybody drinks. So there's some person in a bar who, if they drink, everybody else in the bar drinks. Um, and this is actually logically valid. So, um, so intuitively, one way to think of it is either everybody in the bar drinks, in which case it's trivially true, whoever you choose for X, or there is some person that doesn't drink, and then if you choose that person to be X, then because they don't drink, it is true that if they drink, anything happens. So how might we try to prove that that is valid? Um, so you can prove it by um, trying to prove that the negation is unsatisfiable. So this would be the formula that we want to test for satisfiability. So if we convert it to um, prenex form by basically pushing the negation through the quantifiers and turning the implication into not or and so on, um, then we want to test the satisfiability of this formula for all x there exists a y such that dx and not dy. So if we uh, scholarize, we'll introduce a scholum function for y. So we'll replace y with f of x. Um, now I should say um, there was a slight um, subtlety over the question of what is the set of ground terms if you don't have any nullary constants. So in that theorem that I was just mentioning, I was assuming that there was at least one nullary constant. Otherwise, you don't have any ground symbols. Like if you just had the symbol plus, um, you wouldn't be able to form any ground terms. But I am assuming that if there is no um, nullary constant, then you add at least one. This is actually connected with the question of whether you consider a formula to be um, valid if it's not valid in the case of an empty domain. So first order logic is traditionally defined uh, requiring the domain of term, the domain of variables to be non-empty. So you get a slightly different notion of satisfiability if you um, allow empty uh, interpretations. Anyway, so, so we assume we have a constant C. And then basically we just need to enumerate the set of ground instances. So you see there are still um, infinitely many of them. We have um, D of C, D of F of C, D of F of F of C, and so on. Uh, sorry, well, rather, let's say first, the set of ground terms has C, F of C, F of F of C, and so on. The general one is F to the N of C. So what we need to do is enumerate the set of all possible ground instances of our formula. So the first ground instance is DC and not D of FC. But that one is, in fact, not unsatisfiable. You can choose. Um, it's easy to interpret that um, as true. But then if we add one more ground instance, which is the one where we replace x with f of c, then the conjunction of those two um, is actually propositionally unsatisfiable because we have uh, 
df of c here and not df of c here, so that's propositionally unsatisfiable. And so we deduce that, that this formula is unsatisfiable, therefore the original formula, which was its negation, is, is valid. So that's the kind of, if you like, naive algorithm for testing validity in first order logic. And um, naive as it is, um, this was actually how the, first, the very first automated theorem provers back in the 1950s worked. So they would take a formula and enumerate ever increasing um, sets of ground instances until they got a propositional uh, contradiction. And that was actually where the Davis-Putnam method arose. So the Davis-Putnam method wasn't really intended for solving satisfiability and proposition logic because that was an inherently interesting problem. It was just meant to solve the sub-problem that are testing satisfiability of these big conjunctions of instances. But of course, human beings don't uh, tend to use that kind of reasoning, at least not very often. I suppose sometimes one gets desperate, but normally when thinking about a mathematical problem, you wouldn't blindly try every possible way of replacing a variable by constants and seeing what happens. You would use some intelligence, some understanding of the problem. Now doing that, of course, is a challenge for a computer. Um, if you work in the sort of AI side of automated theorem proving, you may be interested in trying to um, make the machine instantiate variables more efficiently based on some understanding of the problem. However, even if you don't do that, you can at least try to drive the choice of instan instantiation by some kind of algorithmic process. And the most, uh, by far the most influential is the use of so-called unification. So, um, so if we go back to here, so it's, it's kind of obvious that if we want to get a contradiction out of these ground instances, then we need somehow to choose two different instantiations so that the, the term that replaces x in this formula corresponds to the term that replaces fx in another ground instance. So in other words, you can do a kind of syntactic analysis to figure out what kind of ground instances you ought to be using. And this is basically the idea of unification. Um, so again, people may well be familiar with this because unification comes up in lots of other contexts like you know, type checking and uh, all sorts of other situations. But, um, but just to be explicit, um, suppose you have a, a set of pairs of terms. So um, in, in this particular instance I had here, we only need to unify two terms, but it's convenient to describe the general problem where you want to unify a set of terms. So what does it mean to unify a set of, pa rather a set of pa pairs of terms? So if you have such a set of pairs of terms, a unifier is some instantiation of variables, um, sigma. Think of this as a way of replacing variables by terms, such that if you apply it to each SI, you get the same as if you apply it to each TI. <coughs> um, for example, um, if you have the, ter the terms uh, x plus 1 and 0 plus y, then one possible unifier is to set, for example, x to be 0 and y to be 1. Because if you do that, those terms end up being equal. And in fact, in this case, um, I guess that's the only choice you have. In general, uh, it's not the case that you only have one choice. Um, so, um, I don't know what's a good example. So, x plus y and y plus z, for example, can be unified in several different, uh, or sorry, uh, z plus y can be unified in. Um, that's not a good example. Let me think of a good one. Um, so, I mean, a, a slightly boring one is just if the variables are totally different. So, you can obviously unify these in any number of ways. So, you could, for example, set x equals 1, a equals 1, y equals 2, y equals uh, b equals 2. But you could 
just as well choose any term whatsoever for this one and any term whatsoever for this one. So in general, there are infinitely many unifiers of a set of terms. But the nice thing about unification is that if a unifier exists, um, then there is a most general one. It's also important to realize that unifiers might not exist. Um, so for example, there are no unifiers at all of the terms zero and one because they're just different constants. So whatever you choose for a variable doesn't help. Slightly more subtly, there's no unifier of x and x plus one because again, whatever replacement you choose for x, these terms will end up different because you've got this correlation between variables. So there's a kind of loop, looping that goes on here. Um, so in fact, in the Prolog programming language, which uses unification, um, it was traditional, I guess it still is, to do an unsound version of unification where you don't actually check for situations like this where one term occurs inside another. But the nice thing about unification is if there is a unifier, um, so if there, are, if there is an instantiation, then there is in some sense a most general unifier of which any other one is an instance. So um, for example, for these two terms, the most general unifier would be just that x and a both get some variable, say u and v. And you can get any other instantiation from that by a further process of instantiation. So it's a most general one. Whereas if you committed yourself to say u plus one, then that's not the most general one because you can choose more uh, general terms than that. And there's also an algorithm for finding most general unifiers. It was actually already found by uh, Erbrandt back in the 1930s, but then people forgot about it and it was rediscovered several times, most famously by Robinson as part of resolution. And it's, it's a pretty straightforward recursive algorithm to, to find them. Uh, again, the details are in the book or many other places. So there are now many um, theorem proving algorithms that are based on resolution. So they are, you can still think of them in some sense as being based on that same Herbrand theorem but instead of doing naive enumeration, they're using unification to match terms up intelligently. So here are just a few examples of typical um, unification-based algorithms. There are so-called Tableau. Uh, those of you who know sequent calculus, you can think of that as kind of just uh, sequent calculus upside down. Um, then there is a whole school of methods, um, uh, resolution, the inverse method, and superposition um, which you can almost think of as the opposite. So in fact, uh, I guess Maslow, who originally developed the inverse method, explicitly presented the inverse method as a kind of dual of Tableau. So in Tableau, you imagine looking for a sequent calculus proof, um, so to speak, starting from the, um, the end and working backwards. Um, and you can think of the inverse method as just doing it the other way. I mean, depending whether you think of it as a refutational thing. There are also a lot of other algorithms like model and elimination connection method and so on. So, so crudely speaking, if you have any decision procedure for first order logic, the chances are you can turn it into a decision procedure or semi-decision procedure for first order logic by adding unification. That's a somewhat crude statement. And as we'll see, there are a bunch of uh, subtleties that make that not quite true. But broadly speaking, you can... Um, you can at least use this as a guiding principle. For example, um, the, modern form of tab the modern form of Tableau is, is exactly what you get from uh, just throwing unification into a propositional uh, notion of, uh, of Tableau. And resolution is a, re a, a sort of... Um, unification-based variant of the original 1960 Davis-Putnam procedure, and, and so on. But there are distinctions between these uh, different methods. There's, there's one distinction in particular which is kind of hard to appreciate. Uh, I don't want to go too deeply into several different first-order theorem-proving algorithms because it would get a bit exhausting and the details are in the book. But there is a somewhat interesting distinction between 
what are often called top-down and bottom-up methods or, or local and global methods. So the idea, roughly speaking, um, is the following. If you, if you think of, uh, for example, something like the DPLL algorithm or Stolmark's algorithm where you're doing a kind of case split. So at some point in the proof, you're, you're trying to prove something and in one branch you're assuming P and in the other branch you're assuming not P. Now when you do unification, if you have any variables, if, if this is not just a, a propositional formula but say something like x is less than or equal to y, so for example, yeah, if, if, if here we're assuming x is less than y and here we're assuming it's not the case that x is less than y, then in order to be logically consistent you need to actually preserve the unifications in both branches. So in other words, the unifiers that you're applying are in some sense global to the entire proof. That's the essence of top-down methods like Tableau. By contrast, methods like the inverse method and resolution are kind of going the other way where you're not doing case splits like this, but you're starting with an assumed database of facts which are universally quantified and you're deducing new universally quantified facts one step at a time. And in that case, effectively everything you get is universally quantified so you don't need to correlate the unifiers of various stages. So this gives these two different styles of first order theorem proving algorithm different characteristics. In particular, it seems that these bottom up methods like resolution are um, in principle somewhat more powerful because um, it makes it easier to prove self-contained lemmas and then apply them repeatedly. Whereas in these top down methods, you very often would end up basically having to prove the same thing twice in different parts of the proof tree. But that's a somewhat, a somewhat vague distinction. So also the, the fact that in resolution you need the so-called factoring rule, which I'll explain in a moment, is an example of how you need to be a little careful when you just say, take a propositional thing and lift it by throwing in unification. There are a few subtleties involved. Um, so anyway, what, what is resolution? Um, so first let's think about propositional logic. So propositional logic is the following inference rule. Um, you can think of this in clausal form if you like. So we have one clause which is P or A, where A may be some bunch of other clauses or some other formula. And you have another clause that says not P or B. Then you're allowed to deduce A or not B. So intuitively that, that inference rule is valid because either P is true, in which case um, not P or B being true, that means B is true, or else P is false, in which case A must be true. So either way, you either have A or B. So this is a logically sound inference rule. From, and you can think of it as a clausal rule. You know, If you have one set containing P and another set containing not P, then you can form the set which is the union of all the other um, literals they contain. So that's the propositional uh, resolution rule. And you can use that as a self-contained rule to, um, for propositional logic, um, provided you apply it in a sensible way. This can actually be made to terminate event eventually because you, you can basically pick on a variable P and form all possible uh, conclusions that you can get and they all none of them have P and so you've reduced the number of variables. That's not really practical but in principle it's a complete procedure for for refuting a, an invalid propositional formula. So first order resolution is basically the same thing except we use unification. So if you have two clauses just like that where you no longer have two literals that are exactly complements of each other but you have two literals P and Q that can be made complements of each other with a suitable um, replacement of variables by terms, then you find the most general unifier sigma of P and uh, Q minus. I'm using Q minus instead of not Q just in the sense that I, I want to regard minus not P as P, not, not as not not P. So I want to think of negation of not not x literally being the same as x, not, not just equivalent to it. Um, then the first order unification rule is this. 
if you have if you have two clauses like this and you have a most general unifier of P and not Q, then you can deduce um, this. Now, it almost looks as if the fact that this is a refutation complete proof procedure is trivially true because you know that the propositional thing is, is valid, right? Um, and you also know that um, if the first order formula you started with is unsatisfiable, there is some set of ground instances such that you'll get a, a propositional refutation, which in principle could be found by this propositional uh, resolution rule. Therefore, it's very tempting to say, well, whatever the particular instantiations, they're going to be specific cases of the things we'll get from unification. And that is true, but there is one slightly subtle distinction. And this is why we need this so-called <coughs> factoring rule. Um, so here's an example that shows why it's not quite as simple as it might look. So that this is a classic um, logical formula. Um, suppose, uh, so it, it's actually related to Russell's paradox. So it says there's a kind of real world um, like riddle, if you like. You sort of imagine a village where there is a barber, like someone who cuts people's hair and shaves them, things like that. So there exists a barber who shaves exactly the people who do not shave themselves, right? So there exists a barber B such that for all X, the barber shaves X if and only if X does not shave himself or herself, probably himself. Um, so let's try to just uh, refute this formula using um, naive resolution. So if you reduce it to clausal form, that is you break the if and only if into two separate clauses and you scholomize, et cetera, and you use a scholum function for B, basically you get the following pair of clauses. You get um, not shaves XX or not shaves BX, and the other clauses shaves XX or shaves BX. Now, if you consider the, the ways in which we could apply unification here, um, we can actually find four possible ways of unifying those two clauses, right? So we can unify it to make that clause the complement of this one. In fact, it is exactly the complement already, so we don't even need a unifier. Or we can make that clause the complement of that clause by choosing x equals b. And, or likewise, we can do this one and this one, or this one and this one. So there are actually four different ways of, of doing the uh, unification. But if you um, actually try them all out, you get the rather disappointing conclusion that all you get is very boring formulas of the form P or not P out of it. So in other words, it doesn't tell you anything useful. For example, if you unify this one with this one trivially, um, then uh, you're just going to get this one or this one, which is not useful information and so on. So this is kind of a bit funny. So what's actually gone wrong? What's gone wrong with that sort of vague intuitive idea, we have a propositional refutation, and so we can kind of factor it through unification, is that we were considering sets of clauses, right? Now, if x is actually equal to b, then these two things actually collapse to a one element set. And the fact that it collapses to a one element set at the propositional level is not um, is not something that we find out by trying to unify the pair of uh, complementary clauses in the two different literals. So there's a, just one little extra thing we need. So what factoring means is basically we actually need to consider also all ways of kind of unifying um, literals here with themselves. So for example, finding the assignment x equals b collapses this to the unit clause not shaves bb. And likewise, on this side, we get shaves bb. And then it's a trivial p and not p refutation. So that's, um, so that's basically how unification works. Um, and so resolution um, is one of several um, quite competitive algorithms for first order logic. Um, but so far, I've been talking purely about logic and not considering 
um, the equality relation. Unfortunately, in, in mathematics, we very often really care about equality. Um, now, if you use one of these first order validity algorithms for formulas involving equality, it's basically proving validity in all possible models, including those where the equality symbol is something completely different from real equality. You know, it might be less than or something. Um, so very often we're interested in so-called normal models where equality means equality. So how can you modify um, plain first order proof procedures to deal with equality? Um, so one way is you can kind of pre-process the formula. So one technique is to add some extra axioms for equality. I'll talk about that in a bit more detail in the next slide. Um, or there are other pre-processing transformations, such as the so-called Brands transformation. Or you can actually have some special inference rules for dealing with equality, not just the, the standard logical rules. So by far the conceptually simplest way is to add equality axioms. So you can um, basically tell the first order prover everything it needs to know about equality. And what does it need to know about equality? Well, basically that equality is reflexive, symmetric, transitive, and it's a congruence relation for every function symbol. So basically, if you have a first order formula and you want to test it uh, with equality and you want to test it for validity uh, with respect to normal models, you just test um, that formula together with these three things and instances of these for every um, relation or predicate, uh, function or relation symbol that appears in the formula. So that's kind of a crude approach, but it works. It's relatively easy to see that, um, that a first order formula is true in all normal models if and only if um, the augmented formula with the equality axioms is true in all models. Notice that just putting these axioms doesn't actually require models where equality actually is equality, but it turns out that um, if there is a model that satisfies these axioms, then there is a normal model and vice versa. So it's, it, it's not that hard to see that. So that's, if you like, the crude approach to dealing with equality. It, but it's, it's very simple and it, to some extent, works. Um, another, uh, but this kind of has a, yeah, it has a somewhat bad reputation. Um, because most first order provers don't do a great job when given these, um, these uh, extra axioms. Another approach is to use something like Brand's transformation. So what um, Brand's transformation does is essentially use a kind of flattening transformation. So if you start with a formula like this, say x so, so take, say, associativity of a, well, we'll call this multiplication, but it's just an abstract uh, function symbol. If you start with associativity of multiplication, Brand's transformation basically does something, again, it's a little bit like the Satin definitional CNF. It's introducing new variables to stand for subformulas. So it's saying um, if, uh, if, if x times y equals w1, then w1 standing for x times y equals x times y plus c, and so on. And you apply that kind of transformation, and you keep applying that transformation until you don't have any nested applications of function symbols. And if you make that transformation, you no longer need um, the congruence rules. And then there are some other transformations that ensure that you no longer need the other equality rules. So it's not conclusively better. Um, Another approach is to actually add special inference rules for equality. So there's one with the uh, fancy name of paramodulation, which is a kind, of, uh, a kind of analog of the resolution rule for equality. So if you have um, some clause, one of whose members is a formula S, e S is equal to T, the dot means that this can either be S equals T or T equals S, either way around. Um, and you have some other clause involving a term S prime, um, then the uh, paramodulation rule allows you to deduce C or D or P where S prime is replaced by T. 
So it's, uh, it's a bit of a mouthful, but it's kind of easy to see that it's sound because you're just instantiating variables and then replacing equals by equals. So it's clearly sound. What's not at all clear is that it's complete. And in fact, there were a lot of difficult, there still are some un difficult unsolved problems about. So, so could you repeat mm -hmm. what, what is S prime? Uh, sorry, S, S prime is just some other term. And then, um, sorry, sigma is a unifier of S and S prime. So assume S and S prime are two a priori different terms of which there's a unifier sigma. Yeah, sorry, that wasn't made explicit, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and another downside of this rule is that it's very prolific. So if you have an equation, well, especially if you have an equation with a variable on the left-hand side, then that, so suppose s is actually a variable x, then that can match any subterm of any other clause. So this potentially generates a huge number of options to, to try. So it can really blow up the number of things. Um, so in practice, resolution works better in conjunction with um, some kind of orderings on the terms to force uh, transformations in a certain direction. It's actually a pretty complicated field and there are some very difficult technical proofs of completeness for some of these variants. But it's easier to see some of these concepts in the realm of just pure equational logic. So, so let's just focus on uh, equational logic for a moment. So forget about all the other first order connectives. You just want to know if one set of equations implies another equation. So for this kind of problem, it's very tempting to try to use equations as left to right rewrite rules. Um, because again, this is what humans typically do. So if you have some, um, so if you have some, say formula like a ring axiom, you know, x plus zero equals zero or something of that sort, you would generally think of applying it left to right, like you know, you'd, you'd use it to simplify some term that contains a term t plus zero. You probably wouldn't think of using it the other way around. Of course, there are some tricky proofs where you have to, and part of the reason they're tricky is exactly that you have to do that. But for a lot of um, routine equational reasoning, you would think of using things in a particular direction. So it's very common to use approaches with some sort of ordering on terms, um, which requires, you, which requires uh, equations to be used in one particular direction. So if you do that, then very often you can make sure that rewriting can't go on forever. There are certain difficult things like x plus y equals y plus x, which a priori you can just keep applying over and over and over again. But if you have terms that can be ordered in some way like, like this, where in some sense the right-hand side is simpler than the left-hand side, then it's relatively easy to ensure that rewriting will always terminate. What's more difficult is to ensure what is called confluence. In other words, that you get consistent results from rewriting in different ways. Uh, for example, so suppose you have the axioms for groups. Okay, so you have some binary operation which will write as multiplication, and you have a, an identity which will write as one. But this is just abstract symbols. We're not really thinking of these as, as multiplication and one. Um, then if we just apply those rules left to right repeatedly, um, it is actually easy to see that it will always terminate. So that's not a problem. However, you don't always necessarily get the same result if you use the rewrites in different orders. For example, if you start with this term, i times x dot x times y, um, you can first choose to rewrite it with associativity, in which case you get this term. And then once you've got that term, no other rewrite is applicable. Alternatively, you could take the first one and reduce it to 1 times y, and then you could further reduce it to y. So you actually get different results depending on um, which order you apply the rewrites in. So it's very tempting to just order the rewrites to make things simpler and then apply them over and over and over again. But unless you have confluence, you're, that is, unless you get, unless these two things eventually give you the same result, it's not very satisfactory. It's not going to help with real equational theorem proving. It's a bit ad hoc. So one approach to this is so-called completion, which was pioneered by Knuth and, and Bendix. Um, 
I guess it was mainly Knuth who came up with the algorithm and Bendix who did the difficult part of actually programming it in assembler language on some early computer. Um, the idea of Knuth-Bendix completion is that you use unification to identify the most general situation where unification fails. So, sorry, it will, so it will look at situations like this and say, this is one example where things can be rewritten in two different ways. So, so far so good, that's a fairly obvious thing to do, but actually, more interestingly, it then extends the set of equations by adding these so-called critical pairs as new equations. So it takes your starting set of equations and introduces new ones. And so if you do this, it actually gives you quite an interesting mechanical process that takes a series of equations and gives you a, a larger set of their equational consequences. So if you run knuth bendix completion on the group axioms that I just showed you, um, then you get a, a larger set of properties. Um, so, so we start with the, um, so some of these are the axioms that we started with, like um, I guess this one, in fact the last, so the, so the three at the bottom are the three axioms we started with. And just by running this completion algorithm naively, um, completion has deduced a bunch of other equations not only that, it's deduced that if you, if you take all of these equations as rewrite rules, then the resulting set is confluent. So in other words, if you take two terms in group theory, then rewriting them using these rules will always give you well-defined results. So two things will be equal if and only if they get rewritten to the same term. So it's a kind of canonical um, a kind of canonical form for, for group theory axioms. Uh, and um, it's also interesting to see that it's deduced like purely automatically a bunch of axioms that normally, you know, it does take a certain amount of thinking about. I mean, in a first course on group theory, you're you are taught to, you know, prove things like, you know, the inverse of x times y is the inverse of y times the inverse of x. They're not exactly great intellectual challenges, but they do at least need proof. And here they've just dropped out automatically out of this uh, purely mechanical completion procedure. And so all of these examples are things that you can actually try in the real uh, code example. So that one is, is there, I know. Um, so for example, this is the completion algorithm. And there are a whole bunch of different uh, examples. So here's the group theory one right at the beginning. And so you can just yeah, run this procedure mechanically, basically tell it what ordering you want on the set of function symbols and it'll deduce consequences. And it's, yeah, it's sometimes quite interesting. Um, you can get, uh, you can sometimes deduce some very interesting things that are not completely obvious just using completion. So that's a very powerful technique for equational reasoning and in the last sort of 10 or 20 years, there's been an increasing trend of incorporating these kind of techniques into first order provers. So using methods like uh, completion critical pairs and orderings to make sure things get rewritten. As a result, um, it can be very hard to prove that some of these sophisticated first order equational proving algorithms are complete. Um, sometimes people even run them without being completely sure they're complete just because heuristically they, they seem to perform well. And of course, um, all of this has just been talking anyway about um, the fact that we have a semi-decision procedure for first order logic. Um, so in fact, I haven't proved that this is the best you can do, but it is in fact the best you can do. This is proved in the book anyway. Um, so this result, this is the classic result due to, I guess, Church and Turing both at about the same time in 1936. Um, this is also where Turing machines appeared as part of the proof of this theorem, that, um, that validity is only semi-decidable. <coughs> but um, it's interesting to note that there are some cases where first-order logic is completely decidable. Um, so provided your formula belongs to certain restricted classes, then there are actually decision procedures, and that can sometimes be quite interesting. One class is these so-called AE formulas, 
formulas that have no function symbols and all of the universal quantifiers come before all the existential quantifiers when you put it into prenext form. Another common example is monadic formulas where you have no function symbols and you only have unary, that is monadic predicates. You don't have any binary predicates. So those cases are both decidable. And those aren't very interesting maybe at first sight, but um, for example, the monadic fragment takes in all the ancient sort of classical Greek syllogism. So if you have, have ever um, looked at any of this ancient work that the Greeks did on logic, one of the outcomes were these so-called syllogisms of the form, you know, if, uh, if all men are mortal and Socrates is a man, then Socrates is mortal and stuff like that. Well, all of these are very easy to express as monadic uh, formulas. For example, if all M are P and all S are M, then all S are P, we can just express it as for all X, M of X implies P of X, for all X, S of X implies M of X, and for all X, S of X implies, uh, for all X, S of X implies P of X. So you can at least decide all syllogisms this way, which is maybe not very interesting, but it has some historical interest, maybe. Um, so why is the AE fragment decidable? So I, I said the AE fragment is those where um, there are no function symbols and all the universal quantifiers come before the existential quantifiers. Well, that means that if you negate, it's called AE because you think of the A as being for all and the E as being exists. So if you, so we want to test these things for validity, which means testing their negations for satisfiability. So the negation of an AE formula is going to be what we might call an EA formula, where you have a bunch of existential quantifiers, then a bunch of universal quantifiers, and then the main quantifier free body. Well, the nice thing is that when we scholarize that, we're not going to get any non-trivial scholum functions. We're only going to get scholum constants, C1 up to Cn. Um, now, in these examples earlier, where I was talking about enumeration of ground terms, I was saying even with a small language of just a few constants and, and function symbols, you can generate infinitely many terms. But of course, if you don't have any function symbols except constants, then the only ground terms you can generate are those constant symbols. That means that there's only a finite set of possible ground instances. And so, in principle, you just need to test one specific set of all of those ground instances, which may be large, but at least it's finite in principle. So, so that's one example where this uh, stuff is decidable. And that looks somewhat limited, but there are actually some real examples of this in, in subjects like uh, protocol verification. There are actually cases where you can rely on slight generalizations of this reasoning. So yeah, that's just uh, repeating what I've just said. Um, so, uh, and another, another comment is that um, if we're dealing with logic with equality, um, adding those equality axioms, provided you do the prenext normal form right, doesn't change the fact that a formula is AE. So this applies equally well to um, logic with equality. Um, for those of you who know Ramsey's theorem in combinatorics, Ramsey actually originally invented that theorem um, in order to prove the decidability of the AE fragment with equality. But his proof is, is uh, more complex, but it also gives a slightly stronger result. So in terms of uh, automated theorem proving, that's the kind of intuition behind why the AE fragment is decidable. But you could also seek other ways of understanding why certain fragments of first order logic should be decidable. Um, and one interesting one is the so-called finite model property. Um, so both of these classes have the following property. If they have a model, then they have a finite model, a finite model being one where the domain of the variables in the terms is finite. Um, now, if any formula has this property, then actually its validity is decidable, albeit in a very stupid way. What you can do is, in parallel, you can search for a disproof. And because first order logic is semi-decidable, you know if the thing is invalid, that will eventually work. You can interleave that with examining larger and larger models and testing them explicitly for 
validity. So you're basically interleaving a test for validity using the finite model property and an invalidity using automated, traditional automated theorem proving. And whichever way it, it is, whether it's valid or invalid, you know because of the finite model property that if there's a model, you'll find it because it's, there's a finite limit. And by the semi-completeness of first order logic, we know the disproof will find it too. So it's kind of not really a very practical approach, but in principle, that shows why if a formula has the finite model property, validity is decidable. So sometimes we actually have slightly stronger results. For example, in the case of monadic logic, if you have a monadic formula involving n predicates, you can actually prove if it has a model, then it has a model of size two to the n. That's not very difficult. The kind of intuition is that because you only have n predicates, they can only distinguish two to the n different elements anyway. So nothing is lost by kind of coalescing together the groups that are treated the same. Um, and it's also interesting because sometimes if formulas are false, we do sometimes want to find counter models. It's interesting to know, you know, if you have some algebraic theory where something you expected to be true isn't true, it's interesting to know some explicit model where, where that's the case. And there are tools for, for finding these kinds of, of explicit, count, explicit counter models. Um, but for formulas with even slightly more complicated quantifier prefixes, the finite model property fails. Um, so the first one, I think, is the most intuitive. Um, so this is basically saying that a binary relation, you might think of R as a less than relation over the numbers. So it's saying that it's, it's irreflexive, so X is not less than X. And it's also unlimited in the sense that for all X, there is some Z such that X is less than Z, and it's also transitive. So that's an example of a formula that doesn't have um, the finite model property. It's kind of quite easy to see that any model of that must be infinite because of this one. It's saying, you know, every time you have an X, there must be a bigger Z. And because of transitivity and irreflexivity, you can't have any loops in your relation. So it must be, it must go on infinitely. Um, so clearly it can't have any finite model, but equally clearly it does have a finite, it does have models such as the numbers with less than. Um, so that's an example where the finite model property fails. And this one is just a slightly different variant of the same thing. You can just use a slightly simple form of reasoning. Um, but, the reasoning but the reason this one is interesting is that this, um, this shows that even if you have slightly more complicated formulas than AE, if you have like AEA, -A, um, then already you're beyond the range where the finite model property holds. And this is, a, this is one that's maybe not very interesting for logical reasons, but this is actually the expression of a theorem that some of you may have heard of called the friendship theorem. So there is a, it's just a, a sort of nice theorem. I think it's in proofs for the, from the book or something like that. So, so imagine that F is a binary relation, which you think of as friendship. So you, you assume that you're not friends with yourself, right? So friendship is a sort of irreflexive relation. And you also assume it's a symmetric relation. So if X is friends with Y, then Y is friends with X. Now suppose it is also the case that for every distinct pair of people, they have exactly one friend in common. So for all X and Y, there exists exactly one Z that's a friend of both of them. In other words, every two people have exactly one mutual friend. Then it follows from that, that there is in fact one person who is friends with everybody else. That's the, the so-called uh, friendship theorem. Okay. But it's actually um, an interesting example of the finite model property because finiteness of the set of friends is essential. So that's not true for arbitrary models, but it is true for all finite models. So um, I, I also talked a little bit about just um, equality reasoning and techniques like completion. Well, if you have the restricted case where you don't have any quantifiers except at the outside, then that is a decidable problem too. So here's an example. Suppose you want to know that if f of f of f of x equals x and f of f of f of f of f of x equals x, that implies that f of x equals x. 
So it's maybe not immediately obvious at first sight whether that is true, because if that's true, then that collapses to f of f of x equals x. And then we can use that to rewrite that one into f of f of x and so on. And so it gets a bit mind-bending in complicated examples. But anyway, this, um, but after negating and scholarizing, um, then basically you just need to test a ground formula um, for satisfiability. And there are two quite well-known algorithms for this. The oldest one is to use so-called congruence closure, um, which is basically a way, of, uh, a way of manipulating binary relations to close them under the congruence rule. So assume you have a representation of an equivalence relation on a set. Congruence closure will basically close it assuming congruence relations like if x equals x prime and y equals y prime, then x plus y equals x prime plus y prime. This is a classic um, algorithm in symbolic computation. So there are several different algorithms which are quite efficient. There's also, you can actually even reduce this just to set um, by basically considering um, all pairs of possible subterms um, introducing a new propositional variable for each one and then expressing congruence rules by adding various constraints, which looks a bit of a stupid algorithm, but given that SAT algorithms are so amazingly efficient, it can actually be surprisingly good. So that's another case where things are solvable. So, um, so I've been talking just about the theory. What about the practice? If you actually want to use a first order theorem prover in practice, um, well, there are a huge number of first order theorem provers out there, um, all of which have different strengths and weaknesses. Um, so generally speaking, the, the, the kind of theorem proving champion is um, usually Vampire, this system that was developed by uh, Andrei Voronkov, uh, who uh, I think used to be here a long time ago, but he's been in Manchester in England for many years now. Um, so that uh, so there's this there's this annual competition where they test these theorem provers against each other on challenge problems and see um, which ones are the most effective. Um, and in, in these um, problems, vampire usually seems to come out on top. Um, but these other theorem provers do quite well too in special categories, and some of them have other characteristics that people particularly like. For example. Um, Prover 9 has the advantage that it can produce very explicit proofs. So vampire tends to, if you ask it to actually give you a proof of a formula, it'll give you one, but it leaves a lot of um, steps unsaid, whereas Prover 9 gives very explicit proofs. And lean cop, for example, has extremely short source code, so it's a very simple prover. It's a bit easier to understand. And then there are also um, specialist provers, for example, for equational logic. Um, there's Bill McCune's prover, EQP, the one that first proved the Robbins conjecture. And I think the, uh, so as Vampire is usually the champion of first order provers, I think the champion of equational provers is usually this uh, system, uh, Waldmeister. Um, it's actually now been, I believe, incorporated into Mathematica. So I think if you have a copy of Mathematica, you actually have a copy of Waldmeister lurking inside it. Uh, which you may not have known. Okay, um, so that's the end of section two. So um, I don't know, yeah, what people want to do next. So lecture two, the, the part two was a bit shorter than part three. So um, so one option would be just we can finish early and everyone can go home, um, but at the possible cost that tomorrow lecture three might be a bit long. Um, or if you prefer, I can spend 15 minutes starting the material in the next group. I don't know if people have a definite opinion. I think my opinion would probably be that it would be better to start this, this one, but if people are already exhausted. <laughs> yeah, we can walk. Mm -hmm. Okay, so well, who, okay, so who's in favor of um, starting this lecture now? Okay, and who's in favor of stopping now and having a potentially longer lecture tomorrow? Uh, it's horribly close to 50-50. I think I would have to actually count. <laughs> yeah, I have to either count or we could flip a coin. Yeah. Does anyone have a coin?
<laughs> okay. Okay. So if it's uh, so if it's uh, if it comes up with five, we'll start this lecture. If it comes up with the double eagle, we'll wait till tomorrow. Okay. That's a five. So okay. So we we'll start today's lecture. Okay. Sorry, everyone, if you were hoping to go home early. But, but I, I won't take very long, and I, I think, yeah, 15 minutes shouldn't hurt too much. And then uh, it'll be a bit better balance between today and tomorrow. Okay. Um, so, so, so far I've been talking about um, pure first order logic. Um, so is something logically valid over all possible interpretations of the function and predicate symbols? Um, but in many cases, especially in practical applications, you very often don't really care so much about that because you have some specific notion of what you want your functions and predicates to mean. For example, um, you might just want to know, you know, does a formula hold in the natural numbers or the integers or the real numbers? Or, or you might want to say, does it hold in all algebraic structures of a certain kind? Um, you know, does it hold in all integral domains or real closed fields or something like that? And in particular, um, arithmetic theories come up all the time. So um, there's a particular interest in theories of arithmetic. And so we can actually consider both of these, like all of these, as particular cases of the idea of um, validity with respect to a theory. So intuitively, a theory is just some kind of set of background assumptions. But Logically, we can make the following precise definition. A theory is just a set of formulas that's closed under logical validity. In other words, um, in other words, if from a theory you can deduce some formula P, then in fact P is in the theory. So conceptually, you imagine that a theory consists of some assumptions and all the possible logical consequences of them. Um, and there's also some terminology about theories which is useful to know. Um, so we say that a theory is consistent um, if you never have the case that both the formula P and its negation are in the theory. And it's complete if for every closed formula, that is formula where there are no free variables, every variable is bound by a quantifier, either P is in the theory or not P is in the theory. And we also say that a theory is decidable if there's an algorithm to tell us whether a given closed formula is in a theory. So one, again, slightly silly but relevant observation is that if you have a complete theory that's generated by a recursively enumerable set of axioms, then it's decidable. This is exactly the same kind of interleaving argument. If you know that your theory either contains P or not P, then you can start parallel searches for proofs of P and proofs of not P, and you know one of them is going to succeed. Um, so again, this is a kind of, in practice, this is not a very useful observation, but it's somewhat interesting theoretically because it shows you that there's a link. So many theories are generated by a recursively enumerable axiom set. You might just have some standard axioms for, say, an algebraic structure or, or, or uh, some specific axioms that you assume for arithmetic or set theory or something. So if you happen to know that a theory generated by such an axiom set is complete, then in principle it's, it's decidable. But um, we're more interested in practical methods for proving decidability. And one of the most important is so-called quantifier elimination. So um, quantifier elimination is basically being able to replace um, a formula involving quantifiers with one that does not involve quantifiers in such a way that it is logically equivalent with respect to a particular theory. So for example, if you ask does there exist an x such that x squared plus 1 equals 0, then over the theory of complex numbers, that's logically equivalent just to true because the complex numbers are algebraically closed. Um, over the reals, 
the formula does the quadratic equation ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero have a solution um, is more or less equivalent to the formula b squared is greater than or equal to 4ac, except that you have to also consider the degenerate cases where a is zero, which complicates things a bit. So, and again, over the theory of the rational numbers, the formula for all x, x is less than a implies x is less than b, is actually logically equivalent to just a is less than or equal to b. And somewhat less, whoops, somewhat less obvious is that over the integers, um, this complicated formula is true if and only if a is non-zero. Maybe that's slightly interesting because it gives a simple Diophantine representation of negated equality, which otherwise requires a bit of thinking. So those are just some random examples of formulas that happen to have quantifier-free equivalents. The question is, can this be generalized? And is there some algorithmic way of finding quantifier-free equivalents? So we say that a theory admits quantifier elimination if every formula has a quantifier-free equivalent with respect to that theory. Okay. Now, why is that an interesting fact? It's, well, for several reasons, potentially. But most obviously, with respect to decidability, let's assume that we can decide formulas that don't involve variables then if we have quantifier elimination, then we can decide any first order formula because we can transform it into a logically equivalent formula without quantifiers. And we can also assume it doesn't have variables too. Even if it does, we could, because it's a universally valid equivalence, we could just replace all of those with constants. So in other words, um, the quantifier free formulas for say real arithmetic are just going to be things like one times one plus two times three is less than 42, just purely concrete arithmetical things. And usually, not always, but usually, we can actually decide those in the theory very easily. So if we have quantifier elimination, this would actually give a decision procedure. And so there are a lot of important examples where this holds. Um, so one of them is so-called Pressburger arithmetic, which is, um, this is roughly speaking linear arithmetic. In other words, arithmetic not involving multiplication or just involving a multiplication by constants. Um, interpreted either over the integers or the natural numbers. And this is actually quite a useful thing in various contexts. It's actually even used in some very fancy optimizing compilers, surprisingly enough. Um, a more, complex a more complicated example is Tarski's arithmetic, which is um, basically the first order theory of addition multiplication over the reals, uh, or actually any other real closed field. And similarly, uh, the complex numbers, so uh, just um, equations with addition and multiplication interpreted over the complex numbers, or indeed any other um, algebraically closed fields of characteristic zero. These are very... Um, nice examples because a lot of interesting practical problems can actually be formulated. Um, so some theories that don't admit quantifier elimination or indeed don't admit decision methods of any kind at all are um, arithmetic with multiplication over the natural numbers. So by Gödel's theorem, we can actually deduce that that's not even semi-decidable. Um, and it turns out that also um, ar arithmetic, that is nonlinear arithmetic, over the rational numbers is also undecidable. Um, so Julia Robinson found a clever reduction of that to the integer case. Um, even if we just ask ourselves the more restricted problem of eliminating quantifiers, not from arbitrary formulas, but just from existentially quantified equations, even that is, is unsolvable by um, that is basically Hilbert's 10th problem. And so Matiasevich's negative solution shows that that's unsolvable. Interestingly enough, there's, there's this current case, this case which, uh, unless someone knows different, I think is still an open problem, which is basically the analog of Hilbert's 10th problem over the rationals. Um, and it's still unknown whether that's solvable. So, so this shows us there are a lot of cases where there is a decision procedure, and what's more, where there's a quantifier elimination procedure. Um, but there are also a lot of cases where it isn't. So the nice thing about quantifier elimination is it gives us a decision procedure, but it might potentially give us a bit more, because 
You can also think of it as a way of kind of simplifying formulas. Um, if we go back to this example, um, you know, it's not just saying that this formula is equivalent to true or false, but it's giving you perhaps a more, um, a more computable or more concrete formula that's equivalent to it, which might be interesting. So even if you're not interested in using it for a full decision procedure, it might give you ways of il illuminating the, the structure of um, solutions to equations or other things like that. Um, uh, for example, you can use this to figure out what sets you can define by first order formulas and things like that. So it, it has some other uses, but I'm mainly interested in, in decidability. Um, so let's see how much more material I have. I think that might be a good point to stop for tonight. So perhaps we'll uh, leave it there and I'll uh, pick up at this point tomorrow. Okay. So thank you all very much for listening. I hope this is <laughs>